What's up guys, welcome to part two on how to paint a landscape similar to Thomas Kincaid. In the first part, we went over the basic building blocks of the painting. I was showing you the first part on how to get the foundation established, getting some of the textures on there and painting some of the trees. But in this part, we're gonna dive even deeper and I'll be showing you more of the intricacies on this painting. And also, there is going to be a plot twist to this whole thing, so stick around for that. And there's going to be a part three, actually, because the way I went about it did not go the way I expected it to. So, spoiler alert, I switched the oil paints in the middle of the whole project, and I actually had to repaint the entire thing. So, stick around, see what I did, see how I corrected myself, and uh, hopefully you learn a thing or two, because I know I did. So, let's get started. Do it! I want to come back down here and show you how I started painting this bottom part. This is going to be the riverbank, which is going to slope up towards the cabin. So this part is going to be extremely textured with how this ground has all these fallen leaves covering it. The original photo has a lot of this going on, but here in this painting I want to minimize it by adding more vegetation as well as some more rocks in this area. So why am I painting all these black and brown smudges all over here? This is kind of a precursor to painting the fallen leaves, and I'll be showing you how to do this in more detail later on. If you watched the first video, I did a lot of pre-painting where I added dark textures in the trees, so I'm doing a similar thing here on the ground. So with this cabin here, I added an extra grid because it's going to take more work to match it accurately to the painting. There's lots of small edges, shapes, and angles to paint on here, but first I get the main shapes and edges to match up to the grid lines. When painting an object like a building where you have to focus on matching the exact shapes and lines, focus more on filling up the space with bigger shapes than work your way down to the smaller parts. I want to now focus more on the area here below the cabin. I want to give you a crash course on painting these fallen leaves, and it requires a few steps involving texturing. I use my fine detailer brush and start to add these very small brown smudges. Some random shapes, sizes, and a small amount of blending is what I'll be doing here. Next, I switch to a black mixture and do the same thing. What I'm doing is not necessarily painting the leaves directly, but the way they create the shadows and the random ways the light hits them from various angles. I'm obviously not creating any exact patterns here, but I am placing them randomly so that there's a small amount of overlapping the previous layer. Next, I switch to an orange color and stack this layer the same way. I hope you get the idea. You can kind of start to see how this is coming together, creating this texture that resembles leaves stacked on top of one another. Now I switch to a darker orange hue, and this time I'm going to lean more towards blending this color in between some areas where the light and dark values meet. If you watched my first video, I mentioned the concept of using both blending and leaving alone some other parts with sharper detail, and so that's what I'm going to be doing here as well. And last, I add the brighter parts here with a yellow-orange mixture. So I'm just painting this small area here to give you guys this quick demonstration of how I'll be painting the rest of the fallen leaf surface across this riverbank. I'm going to start painting this pathway that's going to disappear into this area of trees, and so I use a tan color here for that. Right now I'm just laying out the foundational colors where later on I'll be elaborating on further. My concern for now is to create this color and value transition so that this tan color fades into green, then a darker green, then into the dark shadows of the trees. So let's do some more work here where I want to connect the riverbank to the forested area above. There's a huge entanglement here that will have trees that overlap the riverbank and parts of the river, so I first want to add the darkest parts here. This time I'm using black in some areas as I paint these smudges in here. The way I've been painting so far doesn't look like much with all these loose smudges I'm making, but this has an important purpose in that it creates a foundation where I continue to refine the texture. Also, in areas like this that have lots of scattered objects that are small, you can't expect to paint every minute detail, and so as an artist, what I want to do instead is to create the illusion of these objects being there, and I use color, variety, and texture in order to do that. I also use some dark green to transition some of that black. And then I add some shades of orange since this is a continuation of the riverbank. This part of the riverbank will have a variety of textures I'll paint later on, such as fallen leaves and more vegetation. Let's do some more work up here. So in my last video, I did a lot of explaining with the various things I do with painting trees. 
Here I'm doing more refining of these leaves that are spread throughout this background. Just like I keep saying in my videos, I work from big to small. I'm kind of doing several tasks over here. I need to make sure there's plenty of negative space between these leaf clusters. I also need to do some overlapping with some dark leaves over the light ones. And I need to establish where the distant background trees are going to be. Painting the thin and narrow tree trunks takes some precision and accuracy. Even though it's a simple object to paint, don't rush it as it's easy to make a mistake by painting a certain part of it too wide or too narrow. Since this tree trunk is the largest one in the painting, I want to showcase it by making sure I give it a high quality surface. It's going to have a lot of overlapping leaves covering it, so at the same time I don't want to overwork this area. The lighter parts of it are a mix of white, brown, and green. The way the light hits this tree trunk is really subtle because there's no direct sunlight, so the light isn't going to be that dramatic. I'm still paying careful attention to the overall roundness of this tree, and so as I paint this rough texture on it, I make sure that I paint a transition of value. And just like with painting everything else so far, I'm doing a combination of blending and using precision. Let's go back here to elaborate. This river bank has a cluster of things going on here like vegetation, texture on the ground, rocks, and a pathway above. The leaf texture on the ground will be similar to what we did earlier when I was working right below the cabin. However, over here I want to have brighter values so that the pathway and this part have more of an illumination that sets them apart from the surrounding areas. The way the plants grow here don't have much of a defining line. There are so many leaves scattered from these bushes and plants that it's hard to tell where they come from. They have some transparency to them where you can partially see what's behind them. Whenever this happens, what I like to do is use blending in the first stage. The thing about a painting versus real life is that sometimes you don't paint the entire object, but a hint of where your colors and values imply that it's there. However, what I do is a combination of this along with adding some detail to whatever I'm trying to paint. The way I paint these bushes is the same way I painted the trees in the first video, except these will be more transparent with less contrast. I'm also adding some detail to the areas where I blended between the ground and the top of the plants. This overall area is going to be one of the brightest parts of the painting, illuminating this garden-like scene. The leaf textures on the ground are going to be brighter here, and so all the different colors I'm using are going to have to be in a brighter value. This means that whatever shading I use will need to be lighter in value but still relatively darker than the values around it. This includes the small rock formation here. Whatever texture I paint here will still need to preserve that brightness. This is why it's really important to not only pay attention to detail but also to the relative color value locally. These bushes here are going to have some flower formations. Along with that, I also want to use different types of green here since this isn't just one plant but a cluster of different ones. When you paint landscapes, using variety with painting a cluster of plants helps to differentiate between the different types. Another important thing to notice is the difference in color value between this area I'm painting right now from that riverbank area to the right I did earlier. One has a bright overall value and the other is darker. Make sure you pay attention to the overall darkness or brightness of an area, because otherwise the painting will look flat. You can paint all the detail you want, but without proper value differentiation, your painting will look cartoonish or just pretty bland. So in the middle of this painting, I decided to switch to oil paints. I'm still using the same principles as I did with acrylics, like the texturing and layering and all that, but with the oils, there's a certain amount of timing you have to pay attention to, since oils do take time to dry. I wanted to see how far I could take this painting if I switched over to oils that can blend better than acrylics. After spending a few hours of using these paints, I noticed that I needed to spend some more time with blending. I know that I spent a lot of time working on the fine details, but I think I overlooked the overall ambience of the painting. There should be a sense of wonder and ambience amongst the objects, including the trees. This is especially true in Kincaid's paintings. I think I used too much color when I was using the acrylics, and so this time I spent a few hours reworking everything that I've done up to this point. One thing I was paying much more attention to this time is the overall lighting. So as this painting is evolving, I'm becoming more aware of not only the small details, but also paying attention to the overall values in different places. You're going to have some really bright areas, some dark ones, and others that fall somewhere in between. You could have a painting where you could paint very loosely and avoid painting any sharp detail, 
but if you have the right lighting and color saturation, the painting can still look outstanding. Painting small details accurately is the icing on the cake. Another really important thing I noticed and kind of discovered was how I needed to integrate the objects together better. There was no sense of unity in the painting. I painted all these trees on here, but they were too separated from each other. What I did this time was that I used more desaturated colors to paint the backgrounds of the trees and didn't deviate that much from the range of color. Also, in order to make the trees look more integrated together, I blended the edges more amongst each other. So at the edges of the tree, I would create a more seamless transition to the next one over. This way, the shape and roundness of the tree would emerge more, giving it a more three-dimensional effect. I realized that I needed to stop using so much sharp detail everywhere, but instead use it for areas that showcase the highlights of the trees. I spent a great deal of time reworking all this painting when I switched over to the oils, and so I have no choice but to have a part 3 of this video coming soon where I finish this project. Painting this and then repainting the entire thing has been stressful, because I know that I did a pretty good job before, but I knew that I had to cover it up. I hope you found this video useful. Check out my other videos on how to paint landscapes, and stay tuned for part 3 where we'll finally finish working on this project. Like and subscribe, and I'll catch you later.